My name is Helen Bailey Postma, and I am an artist. It's been a while since I've had to introduce myself. You know, for me, it started uh, 22 years ago now in Fuzhou, China. It was an early morning, 4 or 5 a.m. maybe. The crows were crowing, and it was cold and dark. That was the day I was born. Most people wouldn't remember their birth, but I do. My biological parents, back in China, either couldn't or didn't want to raise me. Perhaps because I was a woman, so I was adopted by my parents when I was nine months old. You know, I remember on the flight back to Canada, I was scratching and screaming and howling because I knew even then that my roots were in the motherland. It was hard for me to tear myself out of where I know I truly belong. But luckily, I was brought in by a loving and caring family. At home, my, my parents were always very open about where I was from and, and that I was adopted. They never lied to me or, or tried to conceal the truth. Um, and I always felt very comfortable at home and secure. But you know, when I was in elementary school, the kids would often tell me to go back to my country and, and make fun of the way that I looked. And, and they would mock the Chinese accent that I didn't even have. Right? But you know, this, this childhood ignorance can be forgiven. And... I've moved on from this, or I thought I had, but, you know, as I got older, it wasn't children mocking me, it was ignorant adults asking me ignorant questions that kept making me feel like I was different, like I didn't belong. Some weren't harmful, they weren't trying to be harmful, but it still hurt. And you know, of course other people have it worse. There were situations to be in, but all these little aggressions, microaggressions, macroaggressions, medium-sized, they add up. Later in high school, I found solace in the arts. In my senior years, grade 11 and 12, I, um, I really grew fond of, of the arts program. You know, in grade 9, I had taken it. Uh, just as a blow-off class, essentially. And I dabbled here and there, sketching, drawing, a little bit of painting. But I was never too invested in it. And it was in that class that I met some like-minded individuals, um, these peers of mine, that became friends and, and even lovers. And I had some of my best memories with those people. Right? Yeah, and uh, I, I learned with them with the comfort that came with, with being with those people, that um, I could express myself in a more meaningful way through the arts. All this, this, oh, cliche, I know. But all this angst and, and anger and confusion that I felt, I could put on canvas. When I really started applying myself and channeling my emotions into my, into my work, into my art, is when the teacher, Mr. Miller, noticed my dedication, and suggested that I attend Portfolio Night, organized by the University of Ottawa. It was there that I met uh, Martin Golland, who I'm sure you're all familiar with. And uh, he saw my portfolio and he hated it. He was not a fan. You know, but he must have seen something in me, because he granted me early admission. And it was through that 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 I applied to uh, the University of Ottawa's finance program and I was accepted and you know my life seemed like it had direction. I've always had an interest in uh, installation and performance art 
my my appreciation really began when my parents took me to New York, and uh, I saw the Hanging Mobiles by Alexander Calder. I I admired the sculpture's weightlessness and movement, and it was really the the first sculpture and art of that kind that I'd ever seen. In art history class, I learned about fluxes. Uh, I love the way that the artists use irreverence and playfulness to create a serious critique of the art world. Uh, the movement brought elements of installation and performance that audiences could, could relate to and, uh, and engage with. And it drew attention to, to the mundane and then the everyday and you know, these things that, that mainstream galleries uh, hadn't been showcasing at the time, right? This was all new and, and avant-garde and groundbreaking. In my second year of university, I watched How to Make a Happening by Alan Capro. You know, <laughs> I go back and I watch it almost every year. It's one of my favorites. And uh, what really drew me to his work was his confidence in knowing exactly what he wanted. And I strive for, for that level of decisiveness and gusto. And I hope to achieve that in my work. And I try to achieve that in my work. And I do achieve it in my work. I started off my artist's journey as, as a painter, primarily focusing on canvas and, and two-dimensional works. And I, I found that that medium was very restrictive. And I, I started using themes that maybe aren't the ones that I want to express in my art. I focused on my identity, my story, the fact that, you know, I look Chinese, but I'm also Canadian, that dichotomy, that confliction, I, I, I wanted that in my work, or at least I thought I did. I, I felt that that's what I should talk about. That's what I know, right? But that can only get you so far. I, there's only so many works of art that I can make that say, hey, look at me, I'm Chinese. I look Chinese, I'm Canadian, I want to belong, but eventually that, that those themes will run their course. I'll say what needs to be said and then, and then what? Then I'm pigeonholed into being the artist that talks about these specific themes? Then what else is there? And in, in university, I, I felt that professors were encouraging me to talk about this, to really channel this. This is what, this is who I am. This is who I'm defined by. And that's what my art should be. And, and when, especially when you have to make, you know, a new work of art every two weeks, you're pumping them out, right? You're in school. You've got a schedule. You've got to stick to it. You don't have the time or the energy to Really push yourself and challenge yourself and try something new. Try something adventurous. So I was just going through the motions. I made my art, the art that my professors were telling me to make, the themes that I knew how to exploit because that's, that's what I was doing. I was exploiting my heritage and my story for my art. And... It felt a bit disgusting at times, right? Like I'm more than just my story. I have thoughts and ideas that don't pertain to, to my heritage, to the way that I look. And so I started moving towards a different medium where I felt that I could, I could really explore more nuanced themes, okay? more three-dimensional themes with a three-dimensional approach. So I, I started focusing on sculpture. 
And with sculpture, I, I felt that I could say more. And I, I felt that I could really say what I wanted to say. And in sculpture, I, uh, in the world of sculpture, I started uh, really being inspired by, by the art movements and the artists that I truly admired. As I, I got more comfortable and confident in the world of sculpture, one of my earliest large-scale sculptures was of these hanging ice balls that contained different colored pigments. They hung over a collage of papers, and as the ice melted, the pigment and ice uh, splattered all over the collage and created a, a mess of textures and colors. And this was partially inspired by uh, Alexander Calder's work and, and the hanging elements that he employed, and also the ephemerality of Capro's work. It also served as a way for me to move on from uh, the, the medium that I'd previously used, right, painting, and in the themes that I'd previously employed that were about my you know, uh, ethnicity, background, whatever. I had created a painting that I had not touched. I had not touched the canvas. It said nothing about me. It was just random. And it, it also <laughs> served as a little bit of an insult, if you will, to Jackson Pollock specifically. He can make the S word, I'm not going to say it, but I think you know what I'm talking about, on a canvas and make millions of dollars with, it's uninspired, right? It's, it's, it's uninspired. It's ugly, it's derivative, he's the guy's a hack, the guy's a phony, and, and he can he can S-word all over a canvas and call it art, and, and I'm struggling with, with my paintings and, and my themes of, of this and that, and this, this jerk can just pump out this garbage and be praised by millions? It's disgusting. I, um, I apologize for my outburst. Uh, my point simply was, that uh, this, this work of mine had uh, it represented, it was emblematic of my departure from painting, from the medium. And it included, it incorporated um, my main influences and my, you know, my distaste for um, all the things that I disliked about painting. A, a reoccurring motif of a lot of my work is the common orange. Now, a lot of people think, Helen, an orange in your work? What's up with that? Why do you got so many oranges? And when most people see, you know, just a simple orange, they peel it, they eat it, they chuck it, not much to it. That's what most people see. But me, I'm, I'm a, perhaps a little more genius. I see more than just the orange. I see all of the elements of the orange. The stem, you can prick yourself and it hurts. I wouldn't eat this part. What you go for first is the peeling. You smell that? Oils on my finger. The smell of the zest, it's wonderful. And as I peel this orange, my nails start to get tainted orange. I can see the variance in color. There's the pith, the skin, the flesh, all these different colors next to each other, the white, the orange, the yellow, the different orange, the other oranges, a lot of orange colors. I'm an artist, I know about color theory. The pith has a bitter flavor, not very pleasant, some people don't mind. There's tags oftentimes, little stickers. And as you eat the orange, you taste the acidity. This one's rancid, it's been sitting for a while. 
There's the middle section. I don't know what it's called. I don't need it. I throw it out. It's not very good. And the little nub on top. These all have different textures. The middle is so soft, belty a little bit. And the flesh is so juicy. It's covered by a thin layer of skin, which also has a very unique texture. Almost like human skin. It makes you want to wear it. Now see, all these elements together can create so much and leave so little behind. Right? I've eaten my orange. I've disposed of the peel. And what remains? Well, my fingers have an odor and they're sticky. It's slightly unpleasant. My nails are yellow. I can taste the acidity in my mouth. If I eat too many, I'll have acid reflux. This is what's left. And eventually, as I wash my hands and have a Tums, perhaps, the orange is gone. The peels in the compost. The flesh that I ate out of my body and there's nothing. And, and this simple yet beautiful process, when in the right format, lets you think about how fleeting a lot of uh, experiences are, right? There are people, events, they come, they go, and all you're left with is their memory. And it, it should guide you to appreciate the things that aren't things, that are experiences, processes, not material objects, but the things that you can't hold on to and grasp, like peeling and eating an orange. It's very simple, but it, it represents so much more than just that. Why should people care? Yeah, why should people care? Well, it's a fair question, right? Why should people care? Um, my sculptures are, are simple in terms of their parts. Uh, there's no complexity in the making of them. There's no intricacy, really, in, in, in the way that they appear. But why should people care? Yeah. Um, well, it's because my art is, is more than its parts. It's more than the sculpture. It's, it's about the moments. The moments that it creates. It's, um, it's about recontextualizing and, and having people rethink what art is or can be or should be, right? Uh, it, it defies the gallery setting and, and image-based art. Because you can't show my art in a gallery, at least not the way that it's meant to be shown, right? You can plop the pieces in a gallery, but they won't look like much because you can't recreate the moments. The moments that my art creates are unique. There's, there's every time you witness my art, every audience member has a different experience. And, and my goal a part of it, at least, is to continue the legacy, the long legacy, of um, these ephemeral artists and this, this ephemeral style. Um, and what makes it unique is, is that, ironically, anybody can do what I do. Anybody can make my art. It's not about me. Um, it's about... Well, it's about the art. Me being Helen Bailey Postma has nothing to do with, with what my art represents, what it teaches people. It's not about my background, my history, my heritage. It's, it's about the art. Anybody could do what I'm doing. and Anybody could be me. Anybody could be Helen Bailey Postma. And that's what's beautiful about it.